Thank you for uh, coming today to a very special program uh, to help us celebrate Black History Month. My name is Stephanie Street and I am the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. And I'm just so pleased and honored that several of my uh, former colleagues from the Clinton administration in the White House uh, came to Little Rock today. Some of you know Bob and Janice, of course, because they uh, live here, very prominent citizens in our community. Uh, but I'm so proud and grateful that we have uh, Ben Johnson, who served in the Clinton administration in the White House, Terry Edmonds. My great friend Janice Kearney and Bob Nash. As most of you know, because you all are Arkansans, you know that President Clinton had the most diverse administration in the history uh, of, of uh, the White House and of, the, of presidential administrations. And he always said that he wanted to have an administration that looked like America. And I can say that he was very purposeful about that, and you know the the numbers speak for themselves, and the quality of people, and the incredible hard work that each and every one of these uh, people did on behalf of the American people, really uh, every day. And I think you would probably agree with me that there really is nothing more powerful than a diverse group of people working together to solve problems and challenges. And again, today we hope to talk a little bit about some of that during the Clinton administration and how uh, these incredible smart people uh, worked to overcome challenges and worked uh, on the behalf of the American people uh, to create progress and make sure everybody, regardless of what you look like, where you come from, what your race, your faith, that everyone deserves an opportunity. Uh, and so we are going to talk about that today. Uh, let me tell you what each one of these fine people did in the White House, Terry Edmonds, right here, served as uh, the president's assistant to the president and was director of speech writing for President Clinton. Ben Johnson uh, served as a deputy assistant to the president for the White House Office of Public Liaison. And then he also served as the director of the White House Office of the President's Initiative for One America. Janice Kearney uh, served as a special assistant to the president and was the first presidential diarist in history. And she's going to tell you more about that. And Bob Nash served as assistant to the president and director of presidential personnel. Such a critical role in making sure that uh, positions get filled and the highest quality people are appointed to these positions throughout the government, the cabinet, the White House, the White House staff, all the administration, a very critical uh, and important role. So I'd like to sort of get started and talk, ask each one of you to, to kind of tell us what's your path to the White House. Were you, the, did you go to Ivy League schools? Did you get recommended? Start down there with my buddy Ben and tell us, how did you get to the White House? Did you work on a campaign? Were you a VIP? Like what, what was your path? <laughs> I, I was a, a rebel rouser. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I had worked, uh, for President uh, Carter in the Carter White House. I was Deputy uh, Director of Consumer Programs, uh, the person that we, we brought you seat belts and food labeling. Uh, prior to that, uh, there was no food labeling, there was no seat belt laws, and I was one of the people working with uh, Esther Peterson, who was the consumer advisor to the President. And I got involved with the Clinton White House uh, as a result of some of the work that I had done uh, with African Americans. Uh, I had published a book uh, called The Black Resource Guide and I was visiting with a friend of mine uh, who was the captain of the UCLA basketball team, Mike Warren, out in LA. He and I went to high school together and I got a call from Alexis Herman and said, uh, we need you to help us with our black outreach. And would you uh, be willing to volunteer, uh, help me out a little bit? And I told her, yes, I would do it if I could find the time once a week. Well, needless to say, once a week turned into uh, a week a month, two weeks a month. And I told them, I said, you got to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got hired as a associate director. Uh, uh, in the Office of Public Liaison, which was handling the outreach 
for the president uh, around all of his initiatives. Uh, I then uh, became special assistant to the president, uh, and then after he won re-election, uh, I was named uh, deputy assistant to the president, and then uh, two years uh, prior to leaving office, uh, he promoted me to assistant to the president, and I was uh, director of the president's initiative for One America, trying to bring all Americans together uh, to celebrate our differences instead of just fighting over them. Thank you, Ben. Terry, tell us about being the first African-American director of speech writing for the President of the United States and how you uh, came to that very prestigious position. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us here and giving us this opportunity to meet with this wonderful audience. Um, my journey began in the projects of Baltimore City. I grew up, uh, uh, as I said, in, in, in the projects uh, and um, first person in my family to graduate from college. Uh, my father was a truck driver, my mother was a waitress. Uh, neither one of them, you know, uh, had a, a college degree. Uh, when I, I went to an HBCU, uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore, and uh, was an English major. I've always loved writing. Writing was sort of a, a refuge uh, for me, an escape from the, the, the world that I, I grew up in and uh, reading and writing. And my mother always encouraged uh, both. And um, when I graduated from Morgan, I wanted to go into journalism. That was in the, night, the early 70s, and those doors just were not open in, in Baltimore. So I went into public relations work. And I had a succession of jobs, uh, nonprofit and, and corporate. And uh, in 1993, I landed a job in the Clinton administration with Donna Shalala, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as a speechwriter. And after two years of that, uh, I, my work was noticed and uh, I was encouraged to apply for an opening uh, in the White House. I began as a junior speechwriter, a special assistant to, to the president, and uh, eventually I worked my way up to be the chief speechwriter for, uh, for President Clinton, uh, and which is, to this day, is the highlight of, of my career. And uh, it's, it's been a wonderful journey, but it's been somewhat uh, bumpy uh, from time to time, uh, as you might imagine, uh, coming from where I came from. But uh, it's, that's how I got there, and uh, I'm still moving. Janice, you had access and witnessed history unfolding as it was unfolding. Tell us about how you came to be the president's diarist and maybe what that job is, and does it still exist anymore, do we know, in the previous, or the current administration and previous? Uh, I'm gonna follow up with Terry and say thank you to Stephanie and the Clinton Foundation for inviting us here. I think what you do here is so very important, and we all know that we represent what, who Bill Clinton was, and I wear that very proudly. I started out as, um, uh, I worked on this campaign in 1992, and one of the things I tell young people when they say they want to get into politics, you have to start at the bottom, because politics is about relationships. Um, I was publishing a newspaper at the time, but I took a sabbatical from my newspaper because I believed in what Bill Clinton was about. So I worked in his campaign, and when he won, um, I was asked if I wanted to go to Washington, D.C. And nobody believes me when I tell them that that was the farthest thing from my mind. My expectations was to go back to my newspaper because that was one of my dreams as well. So I went to my dad, and people who know my story know that my dad was especially close to me. So I went to him and I said, Dad, they, they asked if I want to go to Washington, but you know, everything I love, everything I know is right here. And he said, your mom and I, all those years that we struggled and we sacrificed and we taught you, do you think either one of us would tell you not to go to Washington, D.C. when you have an opportunity like this? So that was my answer. I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked in the White House for a short time before I was appointed to the Small Business Administration. And then in 1995, as Stephanie knows, uh, 
President Clinton decided that he wanted a personal diarist, someone who would create a living history of his presidency. And, you know, I heard about it and I said, oh my God, that sounds excellent. I had no idea that I would be able to fit that bill, but I did apply for it and I got the job. And if I tell you that that was a job that there's no way I could have dreamed about, believe me, I grew up chopping cotton and picking cotton. So to dream about becoming a personal diarist to a president is something that, you know, I couldn't have expected. And I was a huge dreamer. The personal diarist to a president is a person who was described by a newspaper person as the White House fly on the wall. My job basically was to shadow the president, to create a diary of his day, to follow him around if possible, and you know that man moved around pretty fast, so <laughs> to sit in on meetings, and every once in a while I was lucky enough to travel with him. I was able to observe, I was the official observer and the documenter of what went on during the Clinton presidency from day to day. And I felt like that was such an honor because I did, as, as Stephanie mentioned, I was able to see history unfold in front of me. Some of the things that you saw later on that evening or the next day, I had seen it unfold. And it was definitely a dream come true for me, uh, just to do something beyond what was expected. And that's what I tell children. Do not let anyone dictate what your future might be, because you don't know what the stars have in store for you. So, Bob. Thank you. Stay. They all? <laughs> Stephanie, I want to also weigh in and say how much I appreciate what you have done with this institution. It's a living, breathing, serving facility which represents what Bill Clinton is about, so thank you. But my journey started in the cotton fields in Texarkana, trying to get out of the cotton field. I had no idea that I'd be going to the White House. But it literally started there, which is where I went to college. But I guess in, in 1975, 76, somewhere back in there, some friends of mine said to me, uh, we want you to help this guy who's running for attorney general. And I heard about Bill Clinton, I know he ran for office in, up in Northwest Arkansas for Congress a while back. I said, why should I get involved in that? He said, well, I wouldn't have got out of law school. And me and another couple of folks wouldn't have got out of law school had Bill Clinton not tutored us at night in his apartment. And I thought I was very impressed by that. So I volunteered in the campaign in 75 for Attorney General, licking envelopes. And then he ran for governor, and I volunteered in that campaign. And then he ran again, he lost. I volunteered in that campaign. And uh, uh, so I've been around a long time. And then when he, he got reelected, he asked me to come be his economic advisor, which was very unusual. He had read a lot of the work that I had done over with the Rockefeller Foundation. And so I went to work for him for several years. And then I eventually went to run the Arkansas Development Finance Authority for the last two or three years. And then after the election, I went to Washington seven days after the election. He said, I want you to go up there and help find good people who believe in what I believe in, and I want it to look like America. And I took off and went to Washington seven days after, after the election. And I, so I was in the transition. Then I went to the White House for a month or so. Then I went to USDA as Undersecretary of Agriculture, doing rural development with Wilbur Peer and some other people. And then I went to the White House to run the personnel. I guess it was in early 95 and stayed there until one minute before they took over. Literally, I walked out of the White House at 11.59 on January the 19th, the 20th. Yeah, yeah, so that's how it got. Well, I had the tremendous honor of working with all these folks here and a little bit, I, uh, I started working in the White House when I was 12. I'm a little younger than these folks up here. Uh, but no, uh, just kind of similar story. Was always interested in politics and studied, you know, political science. Knew I wanted to do something in politics. Had worked on campaigns. And, you know, I was a young idealist. And, 
you know, my parents gave me a lot of intestinal fortitude, so I wasn't really very shy. And I went up to Bill Clinton at a rally in Fayetteville, Arkansas, when I was head of the Democrats, and I said, and I had met him several times, my dad was in politics, and I said, you know what, if you decide to run for president, I want to work on your campaign. And he said, you should go to Little Rock and talk to Linda Dixon, and she'll get you hooked up. We're opening our exploratory committee. And I said, okay, that sounds good, because Linda Dixon, who was his secretary, was my dad's secretary for 15 years before she went to go work for uh, the governor. Long story short, I went five days later, I and mean, my parents said they would sort of help me, because I had just graduated from the University of Arkansas, and uh, came to Little Rock, moved in with my sister. Two days later, I was at the paint store working for Sheila Bronfman, answering phones, showing people where to get their dry cleaning done, showing people where the drive through liquor store was, and then I, I got hired about a month later. I was the youngest, I think I was the first, one of the first people hired to actually get paid. I think I got $800 a month. I thought I'd hit the jackpot. And uh, worked through the whole campaign, and President Clinton asked me to, and I ended up working in scheduling advance, and then I went to the White House and was, at 26, and I was the deputy director of scheduling for the first two years, and then in uh, 95, I became the director of scheduling and was there, like you said, till the last minute of the last day. And what a blessing to come back to Arkansas, uh, to come back to this community, to this state. Uh, I had just gotten married the last six months of the administration. When I had the opportunity, when President and Bruce asked me to come back, I said yes, and my husband couldn't wait. He loved Arkansas so much. And, 20-something years later, here we are with three kids, and I count my blessings every day. And one thing, you all both mentioned, you know, how wonderful the center is and all the programs we do. Well, I'm just sort of the person that keeps the train running. These people you see in the back of the room, Lena Moore, Yana Janelle, the folks, the staff that work here at the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Center are world class, and I want to give them all a hand. They are the ones living and breathing Bill Clinton's vision for what he hoped this place become. This was his vision. He wanted the Clinton Center to be part of the fabric of the community. He wanted this place to provide opportunities from kids like him who grew up in rural parts of our state that could dream beyond their own circumstances. So that's really what we try to do here every day with, with programs such as this. So let's get into uh, the program, and I'm going to ask some questions of these folks, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for you, because I'm sure you have a lot of things, burning questions you want to ask these uh, uh, wonderful people here. First, Ben, can I start with you? I want you to talk a little bit more about what the Office of Public Liaison does. I think people may have some preconceived notions, but maybe talk about it from the time we were there. What were some of the biggest challenges you had to overcome in that role in terms of selling to the, the, to the public, not to the Congress, not to the mayors and, the, and uh, uh, governors, but how did you do that? How, and what was the philosophy behind President Clinton and Alexis and you? How did you sell those things and how, why is that important? And do you see that today at all? Well, I think they, they, tried, they, they sell a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what we did, uh, public liaison is made up of a number of different uh, groups. We, you, we had a, a person that was in charge of the gay community. We had a person in charge of the disability community. We, we East Europeans, African Americans, Hispanics. So we covered all the bases of uh, America. And what we did was, if the president had something that he was launching, a program, a policy, it was our job to go out and contact all of the different constituents in these groups to rally them around the president's legislature, legislation that was coming up, or policy. Uh, or if, there, if, if he needed support on anything, it was our job to get all of these people in these various communities involved. Now, it was difficult because on one hand you have East Europeans who some of the issues that they were involved with were diabolically opposed to uh, African Americans. But you had to find a way to craft a talking point that would get to both groups to support President Clinton. And that's what we did. We drummed up support. And, I, and my, when I first got there, my expertise, as it uh, always was, was with the African American community. I knew people all over the community. I mean, I knew the, the ministers, I knew the, 
the, the bankers, the lawyers. Uh, so we used to convene meetings at the White House. We'd have all of the fraternities, all of the sororities, all of the clergy leaders. I mean, we had AME, CME, uh, Church of God in Christ. We had all of them in the same room because the one thing they had in common, they loved Bill Clinton. And we made sure that they were connected. And we and, and the disability community, they would have the lead on getting something passed that would benefit the disability community. Well, we wouldn't take the lead on that. They had the lead on that. But we would support them. We would call all of the ministers, all of the other folks, and say, you need to support this legislation. And that's pretty much how public liaison operated. And I stayed in that, I stayed there for six years. Uh, and it was a, I met some amazing people. And I, I, we had a guy in a wheelchair, Jonathan. Jonathan would go down on the halls in that wheelchair. We had said, you had to slow down, man, before you get a ticket. <laughs> he, could, he could roll that wheelchair with his hands faster than we could run, you know. So, but it was a, a really a joy to work on legislation. I mean, when we went after the, the, the assault weapons, we actually banned the assault weapons. We took them off the street. And that was, that was all the constituents groups working together to get it done. And I think, again, in, in my role is trying to schedule President Clinton and create his schedule every day and work with my colleagues here to make sure what he was doing was reflecting not only what he wanted to do, but what was important for him to do as Commander-in-Chief and all those responsibilities. But also, what I found so challenging is that President Clinton, going to what you said, wanted to personally meet with all those groups. He wanted feedback. He wanted to know that what he was doing in Washington, how that was going to affect the family in Gould, Arkansas. So again, a, one of the biggest challenges was trying to fit everything into one day and all the people that he wanted to see. And frankly, I think that was one of the ways that he was successful because he cared about what other people thought. He cared not just about what the Congress thought or what, you know, the big donor thought. He wanted to know what Janice's sibling is, how's this going to affect them? And I think, I can't underscore how important the Office of Public Liaison was in the Clinton administration and Ben obviously was masterful uh, in that role. Terry, let's go to the speech writing job. I think probably from administration to administration, the role of the speech writer is different depending on the personality of that specific president you're working with and his style, and whether or not he just wanted to get up and read something that you've written. Talk about first what your role was as directing the speech writing office, but then talk a little bit about Bill Clinton, your client, if you will, and the relationship you all had and how for a big speech like the State of the Union, was that like you just wrote something and no, looked no, at it once no. and said that's, that's great? <laughs> talk a little bit about that. Well, writing speeches for Bill Clinton was uh, the most exhilarating, exhausting, and rewarding <laughs> experience of my life. Uh, he was, as you probably know, the most loquacious president in history. Uh, I would probably venture that he's speaking somewhere at, right now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but the role of the speechwriter is to take whatever policy uh, is going on that we're trying to promote and, uh, you know, after Stephanie chooses the audience, uh, we come up with uh, a script that relates to, to the audience and relates to the policy that we're trying to do. Uh, as chief speechwriter, I had, we had a, uh, a staff of six writers uh, and he kept us all busy. It was a 24-7 job uh, with, with President Clinton because, I mean, everything from freeing the Thanksgiving turkey to, uh, to the State of the Union, you know, it required work and research and what have you. So uh, it, it was, it was a, a fascinating job. Uh, I got to meet some, some, some wonderful people. Uh, President Clinton, uh, I will say, was uh, maybe 50% obedient to the script. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as you probably know, uh, he was best when he was extemporaneous and speaking from his heart. Uh, so a lot of times we would give him a script and uh, he would give a speech. I remember the first speech I wrote for him. 
I, uh, I think it was for the Florida uh, legislature. And I, was, I didn't go on that trip, but I was listening to it on the White House system. And when we got to page three, I was like, uh, this doesn't seem like anything that I want to do. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, and th th that happened a lot of times. But then there were a lot of other times when he did speak to, stick to the script. Something like the State of the Union, we had to put on a teleprompter. So he had to sort of keep that uh, in, in uh, he, he stick to, to the script on that. Uh, the Saturday radio address, he gave a Saturday radio address. I think Which, everybody here came from one of those radio yes. probably seven, at least one. Which was like a five minute uh, spiel. And that was one of the uh, times when the president also invited people in. Uh, and it was a wonderful, my mother got to meet him at, at, at one of those radio addresses. Um, uh, my wife, my, you know, my daughter. Uh, so, um, you know, he was, he made sure that he reached out uh, to the people who worked for him and worked with him to uh, include us and, and to include our families in, in, uh, in what we were doing. So it, it was uh, quite an experience, uh, like I said, writing uh, speeches for him. Uh, you know, it's like I've written speeches for a lot of other people, but I will say that uh, President Clinton was the best speaker that I've written for and uh, the most difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> so Janice, you talked about the fact that you were the first diarist. Why do you think that that was an important position? Why did President Clinton really think it was important to have that person? And can you drill down a little bit more deeply into what you did besides, you know, sort of shadow him, look at meetings? How did you recreate each day? And the president, has, from being his sketcher, like, did so many things, both scripted that we had put on the schedule and non-scripted. What, what was your... Tell us the details about how you sort of put together that diary for each day, what it included. Okay. Well, one of the things I think um, that made that position important to him was his love for history and his, his belief that the presidency belonged to everyone. It didn't just belong to him. He thought that it would be beneficial for people to know what does a president do every day? What are the things that um, take up his time? What are the issues that he spends a lot of time with? What are the fights that he has with Congress or with special interest groups or whatever. So my job was trying to tie in all of that into the diary that I, I created each day. And when young people ask me, well, what, do you do? what did you do? Well, I told them, for one thing, both Bob and I worked in the White House and we both went to the very first chief of staff meeting every morning, which was like 6.30? Seven o'clock, so we had to be there by seven o'clock. Uh, for me, it was important because I got a script of what the president would be doing every day. And the chief of staff would go over what was most important for the president that day. And Stephanie would talk about his schedule. So I got a real good idea of what the president's day was going to be like. After that, I would meet with someone named Nancy Hernwright, which some of you probably know. She was director of Oval Office Operations. So I would meet with her and we would decide what is it that you could actually physically do? Uh, what meetings can you actually cover? If he's traveling, is this something that you need to go on? Or should you just wait until he gets back and let people bring back information? So those decisions were made. After that, if I was not traveling, I always had enough to do to go back to my office and work. I actually created my diary on a, a computer that was just my computer. Nobody else did anything on this computer. It held all the diaries, so it was kind of dedicated just to me. Um, if he was there, I would sit in on his meetings, and I did sit in on some pretty interesting meetings, some that got very um, hot, some that he, you know, he had to fight back uh, against Congress uh, or special interest groups. I remember many times Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and he would, would have words, but it was all for one purpose. <laughs> President Clinton's whole purpose, and I believe this to my heart, his whole purpose was to make America better. 
he really believed in America. He wanted to do things that would impact everyone. And that's a big E, everyone, positively. That's why what I did was important to me. I was working for someone that I believed completely in as far as what he wanted to do for the country and for people in the country. So my job was 24-7. There was no question about that. If he needed us to come and work uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning, we would do it. If you're a, an appointed uh, a worker in the White House, that's what you did. I loved my job. It was something I never would have dreamed of doing. Would I do it again? Yes, I would. But it would have to be somebody that I believed enough in, as I did for, for Bill Clinton. Is there another question next? No. I'll come back. Um, I'm not using these cards, as you can tell. <laughs> so, Bob, you talked about a number of positions that you held. I want to focus on your job running the Office of Presidential Personnel. I mean, what a huge responsibility to find the people that uh, were knowledgeable and had the, the that could do the, 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 the important jobs. But again, going back to President Clinton's um, mantra of, I want a staff, I want a cabinet, I want an administration that looks like America. Talk about sort of the process, if you will. There's been a lot of things in the news lately about security clearances, and a year and a half later, why have these positions been filled, et cetera. Talk about, from your perspective, like what you did to accomplish those goals, and if that's sort of the same for every administration, or how does that work? Well, it's different for this administration, but, uh, but I'll say this. You know, I love politics, I love people. I try to get my kids involved in politics and people, and that gives me a minute to, Recognize my daughter right there, Michelle, and my son. They did. They, she's in. They came here. Showed up. Right here. But she's in medicine, and he's a uh, runs a real estate company, and they uh, they do a great job. But they they don't care about politics. They like that. I love politics and people, which is part of why. <laughs> which is part of why I uh, got involved with personnel. <laughs> And how, how I did the job, I had a staff of about 30 people. My deputy, Marshall Scott, sitting right there. And, uh, and, and I had about five or six or seven interns at any time. Marshall took care of ambassadors and other international guests and others. And so basically what I did was go out and people would write it. We got 160,000 resumes. 160,000 resumes for a total of about 12,000 jobs, total. That includes boards and commissions and everything. So you, that's one group you look at. Then you know people, being around Clinton, I know thousands of people. I know thousands of people that he knows. You could line up, in Arkansas, you could line up 25,000 people today in a straight line and walk one of them, get to tell you what their name is, where they're from, and something about it. That's the kind of guy he is. So you start with that. And then he says, I want an administration that looks like America. Well, let me tell you something. Today, uh, the administration does not look like America. In fact, since Omarosa's gone, I don't think there's anybody of color. I don't think, there, I don't think there's anybody of color in, in, in the office. But we had, we had, of African American, just African American, they're alone, Asians and Hispanic, for a football team. And and so and so and they were capable and they were competent and they believed in what he believed in. We lowered no standards for, for anybody. And, and I would argue on, on any objective standards, we also had the most successful. In terms of uh, in terms of interest rates, in terms of home ownership, and so many other programs, and he was very proud of that, and and I was too, and that's what we did. Now on the security, this whole issue about security, you should be very afraid, okay, right now, because there are so many people serving in important positions, making decisions about your life, having to do with transportation, military. Your safety of your water, all these things that are not clear, which means these people have some backgrounds where they could be compromising blackmail. We didn't let anybody serve in a position and see important information or make important decisions, billions of dollars of decisions. We up here made decisions of big, uh, millions, 
several hundred million dollars. Two point five million. But anyway, <laughs> you please count. Yeah, you want you want people you want people to be clear and not be subject to being blackmailed. And transportation. Kathy Brunner, who worked with, with the right, right Slater over there. My they, cousin. And your cousin. Yeah. Right. A lot of important things. These folks are letting folks slide. Be very afraid, folks, please. Let's turn to something a little more lighthearted. <laughs> As you've heard uh, my friends describe, it was 24-7 working in the White House. It was a pressure cooker, you know, nothing ever, the day never unfolded as you had planned. So you're always, you know, trying to deal with the crisis of the moment, trying to plan for the next day and the next week and the State of the Union and the President's trip to Africa and on and on and on. But we also had an up-close front row seat to a lot of cool things. We got to see some really interesting things that unfolded during our administration substantively, but we did have a little bit of fun every once in a while. So I would like you all to talk about one of the cool moments for you in the White House, something that you would have never dreamed you would have had the opportunity to do, or fun, just whatever you'd like to share with our audience. I'm going to start with Janice. Oh, We're not just going to go down the road. <laughs> That's why, um, God, it was so much, so much. And I always say meeting President Mandela had to have been one of the highlights, and his speech um, about President Clinton was one of the most touching uh, moments. But you know what? This week, Billy Graham died, and I remembered that one of the things that was so touching to me was when Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham, came to visit with President Clinton. And I think I told Bob about it, that we were just sitting there chatting, and he stopped and he said, excuse me, and he bent down and laced his shoe. He had been walking with his shoe unlaced. Mm -hmm. And that made me think about the fact that we're all human. This great man is human. Our president is human. Nelson Mandela is human. I left that White House with a greater appreciation for politics, real politics, good politics, than I had gone in with. Because I know if you go in there with the right heart, with the right mission, that we can make the world better. So I am just so grateful for that opportunity. That wasn't a fun one, but that's something that I will always remember. Okay, Bob, you look like you're I, I want to say something. Yeah, I, I uh, remember the trip that we took to Africa, about seven or eight countries in Africa over a 10 or 12 day period. Mm -hmm. That for me was phenomenal. I'd never been to Africa. And we, we stayed about a couple of days in these places and it was unreal what you saw and felt. It was unlike anything you've ever read or saw on TV and the people I met over there, and I still keep up with a lot of them now. That to me was a once in a hundred lifetime opportunity to do that on Air Force One with the president, seven or eight African countries, meeting the leaders of those countries, the presidents of those countries. Anyway, that was. Yeah. Ben Johnson. Well, I was there for eight years, so you can imagine how many events I got a chance to participate in. And the one that uh, probably was the best was, uh, for me anyway, it was the state dinner for Mandela, uh, where we had the event, in the, as you, Stephanie, as you know, in the Rose Garden. And uh, the entertainment uh, for that was uh, uh, Whitney Houston, because Mandela loved Whitney Houston. And, after um, after that, oh, it was every, everybody was there. Uh, Tom Joyner, <laughs> but because uh, that was my job to make sure all those people got there. Stay tuned. That was your job, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but to, to see uh, a Soul Train line being formed <laughs> in the in the state dining room, <laughs> which is where the after party was. And to see President Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Alexis Herman going down the Soul Train line. <laughs> and, 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 but 
you know, uh, there's so many things that you could you could say was just spectacular, uh, and you can't quantify. You can't say one was better than the other. I was when Yasser Arafat came and signed the Israeli peace accord with uh, Secretary, I mean President Rabin. That was a historic moment. Uh, you know, and when uh, Leon Sullivan would come over and Jesse Jackson would come over and, and Cicely Tyson would come over and, and then you'd have uh, Gladys Knight performing and Count Basie performing. And, uh, but the thing that sticks in my mind, and this was not a fun thing, but it was a very, very momentous event. Uh, thing was when a student from Rwanda came to the White House when uh, Count Basie was performing and she said your country should have done more uh, to stop the violence in my country and the uh, president apologized to her for not stepping in sooner to stop the violence over there. So I can go on and on, but no, it's not. We get the picture. You had a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Terry. Okay, everybody has met Nelson Mandela. You met him in Africa. You met him at the state dinner. I met him in Disney World. Oh. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but President Clinton had some secret meeting in Disney World with Nelson Mandela. And, I mean, and so that. you scheduled that. No, I did not. Oh, you didn't schedule that. Okay. Well, Sharon Palmer was here, I have a picture to prove it. Uh, so, uh, so that was a highlight for me, too, to get to, to meet uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, and I would have to say, being the chief speechwriter on his final State of the Union uh, address was really a highlight, too. But the real moment that sticks out in my mind is something that most people probably would not recognize, but in 1997, uh, President Clinton went to Morgan State University, my alma mater, to give uh, the commencement address. And I think it was one of the first times, if not the first time, that a president had given a commencement address at a HBCU. And my alma mater, so, and I had, I wrote the speech or I helped him write the speech. One thing uh, speech writers do is never take credit for the speech. It's the president's speech. Uh, and I was just fortunate enough to help him out with it. Um, but I, I rode over with him in the uh, El Marine one from, uh, from the White House to, uh, to Baltimore. And um, during that speech, you know, he mentioned some great uh, uh, Morgan grads who, uh, who had done great things. But, and unbeknownst to me, he, he pointed me out and said, uh, my, uh, my chief speechwriter, Terry Edmonds, class of 1972, uh, and uh, that was really a, a great moment because my family was there, my wife and my mother. And, and uh, so that was a highlight for me when he went to my alma mater and gave the uh, commencement address. Well, before I open it up to uh, the audience for questions, I'm going to tell you about two of my favorite moments. One is more serious and one I think everybody here uh, will identify with. The first, um, I think, really speaks to Bill Clinton. Uh, the man who cares deeply about other people and providing experiences and opportunities. Um, I grew up in a very Catholic family, both my mother and my father. I went to Catholic schools, and um, so when President Clinton was going to welcome Pope John Paul II to come to the United States and meet in St. Louis, he invited me to go on a trip into Air Force One, and it, literally he loaded up the plane with as many of the Catholic senior staff as he possibly could. <laughs> So uh, we went to St. Louis, and as we were getting off Air Force One, I saw him go over and talk to the chief of staff and to the military aide. Uh, and he said, uh, I want you all to make sure, I know this is going to be an issue with protocol, but I want every single person on this plane who is Catholic or wants to meet the Pope to have the opportunity to shake his hand and get their picture told. I don't care what the protocol from the Vatican, which, by the way, is the most unbelievable strict, uh, protocol conscious uh, organization you've ever seen, but he said, I want the baggage handlers, I want the folks in the kitchen, I want every person in the motorcade, the volunteer advance drivers, and every single one of those people had an audience and a picture with President Clinton 
and Pope John Paul. It's my mom's proudest wall of fame, because some of my siblings were actually on that trip too. They were driving the motorcade and doing the press events, and they got to, to have that photo. So I think that speaks to the character of that man, that he was, you know, obviously he was going to have his meetings, but he wanted to make sure every person that was on that trip, no matter if they were assistant to the president or they were, you know, cooking the food, uh, they got to, to have that incredible once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The other one that stands out in my mind is an avid Razorback fan and a U of A grad uh, and a lifelong Razorback is uh, when the uh, Razorbacks in 1994 went to the Final Four. And again, I was so grateful that I was uh, able to accompany uh, the president on that trip and watch my uh, hometown Razorbacks win that. And then, even more as exciting, when President Clinton invited them to the White House and we had our big celebration event in the Rose Garden. I, I put that in my top five White House experiences as uh, being a witness to that piece of history. All right, now y'all don't be shy. I'm gonna open it up for questions and I will, please wait for the mic. I think we have our volunteers so that uh, everyone can uh, have an opportunity and please stand up and say your name. And I see uh, our mayor over here, Pat Hayes. Well, thanks, Stephanie, and let me uh, add to what uh, all have said on the panel about how much uh, we appreciate the work and the staff that you do here. Those of us that live in the neighborhood, you know, I can be here in five minutes, and, uh, and it's incredible, you know, the kind of uh, opportunities we have, and certainly particularly this panel and what y'all have shared. You know, both you and Bob I've uh, been friends with for a long time, and I certainly compliment the rest of y'all for the contributions you made to the Clinton White House. And, and going back to what you talked about, a lot of what a President's Day can be scripted, not scripted, but it can be planned, I guess you would say. Uh, I know one of the things, and, and he was incredible in trying to include not only you know people that he knew from a political standpoint, but particularly Arkansas, because I can remember you talk about Nancy Hernwright. You know, one time, you know, I had a, a meeting in Washington and I just wanted to try to see him about a municipal issue. And, and Nancy, you know, it was only one day that I was going to be there, and Nancy said, well, he's just all blocked up. And, and then she said, well, just a minute, Can, how long do you think it's going to take? And I said, well, just a you know, very short period of time, a couple minutes, something like that. And she said, well, now he's going to be walking from one side of the White House to the other side of the White House. Do you think you could get that done in the walk? And I said, well, absolutely. So, to the, just to give some an idea of how committed he is to both keeping up and to trying to make sure that he listens to folks from all different directions. You know, he scheduled me for that two or three minute walk to go from one side of the White House to the other. And I guess that's kind of what leads into my question is, is how often was your, you know, particularly in scheduling and, and jobs that you did and, and those of you that may have had a part of it, how often did the day evolved where a crisis or a problem occurred that had to vary that, maybe even from the speech writing standpoint, talking points. I mean, how, how often did world events dictate your, uh, uh, your involvement? Every day. No, I'm, I'm, that, I'm not saying that to be cute or funny. I mean, literally every day you would, in great detail, we would be at the White House until 2 a.m. planning the schedule. Because back then we didn't email. I mean, we had to print out the schedule, had to go to the White House print shop. We had to physically walk and put them under every door of every person in the OBOB, Old Executive Office Building, and in the White House. And then something would happen in the middle of the night. I would have to call my staff at 4 a.m. and say, come on down. We've got to change this around. And, Ben would be there, and Janice, and we'd all be trying to figure out how we were going to find time for the president to go to this funeral, and we were going to have to cancel these events. And I mean, literally, I can't say that there was ever one day in the White House that unfolded exactly as you planned. But that was the routine to us. I mean, you don't ever expect it, and you sort of learn how to deal with the challenges. Yes, and Terry. Speaking of, from the uh, speech writing uh, <laughs> point of view, there were many, I felt like a fireman where I would get a call in the middle of the night saying, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing happened or Elian Gonzalez is going back to Cuba or whatever. Uh, and uh, we would have to really uh, turn on a dime and get, you know, turn around the speech quickly that he would deliver like in the Rose Garden or in, from the Oval Office or wherever. Uh, so there were, there were multiple times when 
uh, you know, the schedule just got blown up and we had to change. Even if he were giving us a major speech, uh, we would have to create what we call a topper, where, you know, uh, before I begin, I want to, you know, give my condolences to the families of the, the victims of uh, Oklahoma City or whatever. So, yeah. And it, it, it became a chore uh, because for us, we were to contact with the outside world for the most part. And for instance, when Barbara Jordan died, we had to go to her funeral. We had to take her to her funeral. But the, we had to decide, well, who, can, who should we take to her funeral? And that was the difficult task because you had all these prominent people that wanted to go with the president to her funeral. So we had to decide who's going to get on that plane with us. Vernon Jordan, uh, Bill Gray, all the different kind. And we had to know the background of them in connection with Barbara Jordan. So our staff had to do all that research. And we didn't have much time to do that. You had to literally work around the clock to get that done. But uh, after a while, Working in the White House and being there, I know myself for eight years, it became old hat. You know, you just yeah. instinctively know uh, how to do it. When Ron Brown died, we had to decide what the invitation list was going to be like to take to the to the uh, funeral and where people were going to sit. You know, I mean that's uh, it, it, it's a big task and you know. We, that's when I lost my hair, my hair turned <laughs> gray. <laughs> Lonnie, you had a comment there. When Ben was talking, oh, I'm sorry. When Ben was talking about making the decision, uh, here was a president who also understood the importance of sorority and fraternity bonding. And, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Delta. Yeah. Barbara Jordan was a Delta, so they invited Deltas to also go on uh, with the president, but they came from California to DC to ride on Air Force One as well. So. And probably an even bigger challenge, like you decide on the manifest and about an hour before you were leaving, he's like, oh, just so you know, I just called so-and-so and they're gonna meet us at Air Force One out at Andrews Air Force Base, make sure they have a seat. Yeah. And then you're trying to figure out who's getting pushed off or who's gonna be sitting on the floor, et cetera. Sometimes it's a little different. You get, you would get a call from Stephanie, maybe nine o'clock at night. The president says he's gonna look at a movie. You wanna come over and look at a movie? <laughs> yes. there's a movie theater. He might be at the office working, but he might be at home. But there's a movie theater in the White House, and he did invite several people over there and do it. Watch raise back hand and watch the movie. That was always fun. That was fun. That was yeah. fun. I wanted to add, probably everybody in this room, if you went into DC and you called over to the White House. So this is a credit to not only you all, but everybody who worked. And you always say it comes from the top down. So that meant the president had given you all and everybody else, folk from Arkansas particularly, when you call and say you're there, and they would invite you in. So most of us in this room had opportunities too that I call pinch me experiences. Absolutely. Sure. Step wait, I, I just wanted to say Ben mentioned it, but the Ron Brown, the death of Ron Brown, I think I really appreciated how important it was, your job, uh, because that was something that nobody expected and it entailed so much afterwards. Yes. Yeah. And we had so little time to get yes. together. Mm -hmm. It was yeah, spent the night in our offices. Yes, sir, right here. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Valley. Uh, now, the ladies, oh, the, the, this question is for the men here. The ladies have already expressed their, uh, how their parents felt about their positions. Uh, so, my question is to you all how, how did your parents feel about uh, the position that you held with them uh, working in the presidency? Well, I'm the oldest guy uh, sitting up here, oldest person sitting up here. And unfortunately, uh, my dad was born in 1895. So daddy uh, had gone to heaven a long time before I got to the White House. And my mother died uh, a year before I got to the White House. So they didn't have the opportunity 
Uh, but my aunt and and all of my siblings, uh, uh, they were around and they were proud as a family. Yeah, I would say, uh, well, my mother and father, or stepfather, uh, were very proud of the fact that I was uh, working for the, for the president. And uh, again, one of my proudest moments was being able to bring my mother into the White House to, to meet the president. And of course, she said something like, you know, y'all treating him good? You better, treat, you better treat him right. <laughs> you know how mothers are. They don't care. And uh, so, yes. And not only that, I would say my extended family, my community, uh, and you know, the African American community, uh, Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine, they did little stories on me. So uh, there was a lot of pride uh, in, in the community uh, for, what, for what we did. Uh, my father died at a very young age, he was 52, heart attack. My mother, uh, when Bill Clinton was governor, my mother uh, uh, had uh, pancreatic cancer and the doctor said she would live about three months. Well, I didn't know it, but she was going to have surgery. And the president, I'm sorry, the governor called her at the hospital and said, I hope you're going to get well, I'm praying for you. And she told him that he was going to be president one day and she was going to live to see that. Now, she lived uh, a year and a half. They said she was going to live three months, but I'm convinced that she lived that long because she was waiting to see him be president. She didn't make it. And he, he, she died before he became president. But I always appreci personally appreciated that from him. But she knew he was going to make it, and she said, you got to go with it. Uh, hi, Bob, all of you. Welcome back, and uh, appreciate everything that's done here at the Clinton Library and at the Foundation for the Community. It's absolutely wonderful what we get from uh, the service that Bill Clinton rendered for the country. Uh, Bob, my youngest daughter came down and worked for you there, and her experience was exemplary. Um, she loved the intervention. She liked having to get uh, General Wes Clark's portfolio available and ready. Um, and she talked about the fights that you often had with cabinet heads who wanted to put somebody in. Uh, so would you speak to how involved that personnel office was? And the one thing that Maxie, the president, told her specifically was, I want young people hired. I don't care if they're Democrat, Republican, or whatever. Put, get as many young people in here as interns as you can possibly get. Well, she did a wonderful job. She was a search manager for me. Uh, we didn't hire that many Republicans. <laughs> but, but, but in some cases, seriously, you, you had to have a Republican. If you've got a five-member voter commission and the president's a Democrat, two of them have to be Republicans by law. Like right now, with, with uh, Trump in there, you have to have two Democrats to serve on a board or a commission, so that's that. Now, in terms of this fight, Kat, the way this works is, you get names of people who submit applications, cabinet secretaries would send in names, and sometimes we get a list of names from a cabinet secretary, and they have five white males on it. And I said, send that back. Uh -uh. We gotta have, the president wants an administration looks like America, and they've already got five white males over there. So we have to fight with them. And I, and I had a secretary one time say to me, I said, listen, I've got a, I have a, I have a, a, a African American female that I want to put in that job, and this secretary would say, "Well, wait a minute, now we, this is an important job. I got to have somebody knows what they're doing." And I said, "Wait a minute, do you know who I'm talking about? Do you know what, what's? Have you seen the resume?" They, they realized what they said. They made an assumption that that person, and by the way, that person was ten times qualified as anybody that was on their list. Anyway, so I, that's the kind of dynamic. Well, as the moderator, I'm going to exercise my privilege to ask the final question. And like each of you in one minute, because Lena's giving me the Heisman back there that we got to wrap things up. Uh, if you could share, I don't see a lot of young people here because they're all in school, but all of you here have 
kids, grandkids, friends, neighbors, etc. So I'd like for you each in one minute to tell what would you tell young people about pursuing a career in public service or how to? And we'll just go in order. Ben, you're up. I tell my kids to try to make some money. <laughs> You know, I said who are interested in careers. It's, it's not for everybody. Well, I, well, well, first of all, they need to understand what politics is. And politics, uh, the way I was taught, means one thing. Gaining, maintaining, and using power. And see, what happens, we get in it because somebody looks good, or somebody this and that. But, you need to have power to have better water quality laws. You need to have power in order to have equal opportunity. You know, one thing Bill Clinton always talked about is opportunity for all and responsibility from all. And what you need to do is teach these young kids to have a value system, a value system that will mold them and make them strong, but give them the right direction. You know, I don't believe in in getting involved in politics as a Democrat or a Republican. Look, my whole thing, the reason I supported Clinton the way I did was because of what he stood for. And what we're talking about is somebody that's going to be pushing to elevate the entire community. And let's talk about celebrating our diversity instead of being divided by it. Thank you. Terry. Okay, uh, I would say that I'm very impressed with young people today uh, and young people of my generation, young people today, because I think there's so much energy, so much idealism that they already have. And if they want to channel that, uh, one of the best ways to channel that energy to make a better world is through public service. And uh, you know, it, it, it's been something that's been uh, near and dear to my heart. I grew up, you know, I wasn't political, necessarily political, but I always had a, a social conscience, and I was always interested and curious about the world and wanted to make, you know, a better world. And fortunately, growing up in the 60s, you know, we had role models like Martin Luther King and, and uh, Nelson Mandela and Muhammad Ali to, to, to sort of inspire us. And I'm very happy that my daughter now is in public service. She uh, is a, a doctor of nutrition at the Food and Drug Administration. So the legacy goes on. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Terry. I am very hopeful when I see young people standing up for what they believe in. Um, one of the things I've always told young people is that whatever things are out there that you complain about and whine about, and you want to see changed, find a way to help make that change. And I think the world will be a much better place because us, we do a lot of complaining. We don't do as much to change the world as we should. But our young people, I'm very hopeful. As I, as I say, I fail to get mad involved in public service, but no, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Uh, my daughter, she she teaches at the med school, and that's that's public service. My son, he he's, he can sell ice to a snowman. He's a great real estate guy. But but what I would say to young people is volunteer with some nonprofit organization. Get involved in somebody's campaign because the way this stuff works is if you're an elected official, any one of you, if you get elected to something, you want to hire people who believe in what you believe in who help you get elected. So get involved in somebody's campaign and follow them. And that's what, when I started, Bill Clinton was like back in the 70s. And I sort of kept up with him over the years. So I would keep it my clean, no drugs, uh, keep, no criminal records, okay? Those are kind of, that's just basic stuff. And you'd be surprised at how many people I had to kick out because of that. They grew a pride. They couldn't get in because they had some of those problems. That's what I was saying. Well, let me just say again how grateful I am to these former colleagues and lifelong friends for coming to the Clinton Center to Little Rock to talk.
talk and share about your really incredible experiences uh, working in the Clinton administration. I'm so pleased that some other folks who work with us, Catherine Grundon and Marsha and Lottie and other folks here in the audience came today and uh, hope you all have a wonderful day.